Pinkerton's Ghosts is a horror anthology podcast by Superversive Radio, with no affiliation with any detective agency, person, real or imagined, or of the dark forces of Outre Terre. It is not intended for children. This is Jim Donovan. It's Christmas Eve and I'm sitting at home in a leather recliner with my pet lizard on my lap, sipping a glass of brandy. All I need is a smoking jacket and a cigar, and the image of British Professor will be complete. Or Bond villain. I'm good either way. Hey, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. <laughs> I had to get some packing done, but I needed to record this before I catch a flight later tonight. Ugh. Anyway, that's beside the point. Control there is an old Navy tradition, dating back to the Second World War. Submarines that are lost at sea are said to be on eternal patrol, forever guarding the country's coastline. As a result, during the Christmas season, communication hubs on the coast send out messages to those lost subs, wishing them a happy Christmas. This year, someone came back. It was the day before Christmas Eve. I decided not to visit my parents this year. Things have been a little bit too active where I was. I was going to call them on the day, but I figured it would be easier to not actually you know, see them. I guess I haven't talked to them since my brother died. I definitely haven't talked to them since the Loki incident, you know, after we rescued Control. There's just... I don't know what to say. There are too many memories I'm afraid I'll dredge up. They'd ask me questions that they're not going to be ready for the answers. A contact of mine, Captain Jason Smithers, in San Diego, asked me to come down and help him with an anomaly. I met him after the incident off the Oregon coast with the fish folk. He had apparently been in the know about the Outre Terre for some time, having been temporarily lost in the Bermuda Triangle when he'd been a freshly commissioned lieutenant. He never told me what he saw then, but I'm hoping I can get him to make a report for us at some point. Smithers was one of those unique dual citizen guys. His dad was Navy and was stationed in London while his wife was pregnant. As a result, Smithers has a thick British accent that I'm sure I'm going to butcher when I record... I hope he never listens to this report. Anyway, I drove down to the naval base, gave the guard my ID, and drove to Smithers' office. At the door, I went through a metal detector. While the guards didn't care about my soul stone, <laughs> they didn't even know what it was, they were not pleased when I informed them about my Colt 1911. Apparently, there are a lot of regulations regarding anyone, even military personnel or civilian contractors, having concealed weapons on base, even if they have a permit. They rang up the captain, and he had apparently filled out all the paperwork for me before I'd even gotten on base, fearing me to carry. <laughs> nice to have friends in high places. When I walked into Smithers' office, I noticed it was stark and utilitarian, which I expected from a military man. I also noticed a small My Little Pony plush toy on the desk next to the obligatory pictures of his family. That was not what I expected, but I guess everyone has to have their hobbies. The captain talked to me for a bit, apparently a submarine the USS Wahoo, if you can believe it, had been lost since 1943, and it had drifted back into harbor, where a naval tugboat had drawn it into dock. All accounts say that the Japanese had destroyed it. Since Smithers had his encounter in the Triangle, he was aware that weird things exist in our world. And after a few men had been lost inside during the investigation, he declared the area off-limits and had erected a temporary structure around the whole sub-pen. He would prefer not to let days in first, as they would have to go up the chain of command about the missing men. Days were very indelicate about reports like that. Better to trust an outside contractor. Plus, he was uh, <laughs> willing to pay my interpretation of our rates. Pity for him, I'm just terrible at math. So, I said, the sub has been missing for a while, but what makes that unique? Surely missing things turn up all the time where the ocean's concerned. Right, said Smithers. So, the official story is that the Wahoo was bombed by anti-sub planes, but there are no hull breaches on the sub. No evidence that the pressure of the ocean had crushed everything and everyone inside. It's pristine. Flawless. It looks like it came just off the dry dock assembly. And I need to know why. Frankly, none of my men are equipped for this. So, that's how I found myself in the middle of the naval base, standing outside a prefab building housing a large World War II submarine. The captain walked me up to the door leading inside. There were a couple of military police guarding it. They saluted the captain and he dismissed them. 
telling them to report to the base psychologist immediately. They practically sprinted away. I looked at the captain. He looked back and grimaced. There are some things I didn't tell you. I need you to approach this with fresh eyes, but um, don't believe whatever you see in there. Are you coming in too? I asked. No, and no one is coming in after you either. Whatever you find in there, you deal with on your own. I'm not risking any more lives on a mystery that I can't begin to solve. I hate to lay this on you, but you're an expert. We're just swinging wildly in the dark. And if I can't fix this, I said more than a little bit peeved. Then I'll get a tugboat to drag it out to sea and scuttle it, the captain said with a grim expression. Jason, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I feel like you've set me up. You don't have to do it, Jim. I don't have anything on you, and I wouldn't try to ask you to do this for history or your country or anything. There's something evil about this sub. Three men have gone missing inside it already. I can't send any more inexperienced search parties. But if you find them, please bring them home. The captain stepped aside, nodded to me, did an about face, and walked away. That was an odd experience. I stood there for a second. A breeze blew in from the ocean. I looked west, towards the horizon, and heard something whisper my name. Just a little Jim, and then nothing. I shivered in my jacket. It was winter in San Diego, after all. It was nearly 50 degrees outside. I took the soul stone out of my pocket, gripping it tightly like it was Sean's ring of dispel, and walked into the submarine pen. It looked totally bland. Nothing inside. It was just a prefabricated building, built around a pristine-looking sub. I'd never seen one up close before. Never knew they were this big. It was like the length of a football field. The ship's name... The USS Wahoo, <laughs> man, what a stupid name, was stenciled on the side. There was a gangplank leading from the dock to the ship, a guess that had been erected before the three missing men caused the sub to be abandoned. I walked the creaking gangplank. It bounced under my feet. I was sure the sub was floating steadily, but I never lost my sense of movement. A sudden breeze blew out from the open sea, which should have been impossible. The submarine was entirely enclosed. On the breeze, I heard my name again, whispered by a woman's voice. The hatch leading inside was opened. I took a deep breath and descended into the depths. Immediately upon entering, everything went dark. Not that I was seeing darkness. No, there should have still been some light coming from the hatch. Instead, it was like my optic nerves had been shut off, despite feeling like my eyes were still open. If you've ever been inside a mine shaft or an underground bunker and someone turned the lights out, and opened your eyes in pitch black. You know what I felt. It's a crawling inside your eyelids, like there is something you know is just outside your reach, hungry and waiting for you. The reason mankind fears being alone in the dark is because we're afraid we aren't alone in the dark. I could hear a soft woman's voice. It was musical, lilting. It caressed my ears like a masseuse. It whispered my name. Control, do you remember the old Pepe Le Pew cartoons? The ones that got censored and banned? When he sniffed a lady cat, he'd sort of float along, drawn by her scent as though he was in a trance. It was the same way with me. In the darkness, I was drawn one foot in front of the other, until I ran into some metal objects. I smacked my head and my knee at the same time. Oh, it hurt! It did a good job shaking me out of the enchantment. I was still holding the soul stone, so I began to let my eyes relax and tweak the threads of reality so that I could see more easily in the dark. I stopped when that became unnecessary, when the whole sub was flooded with a dark red light. I had read something about this, that submarines tended to use red light because it was harder for enemy vessels to see red light reflected from the periscope. It wasn't ominous at all that the only barrier against the darkness was washed in red. I had my first view inside the submarine. It was very narrow. On every side of me were horrible, uncomfortable bunks, stacked three on top of each other. I guess there wasn't room for the enlisted men to sleep separate from the day-to-day -day operations. It had to be hell living on this thing. It was totally empty. All of it. I expected to see skeletons or mummies or something. Instead, I saw faded pictures hanging by most of the bunks, and no other signs of habitation. The voice started calling me again. 
This time, I was steeled against any hypnotic influence. My head and knee were still smarting. In fact, I think I gave myself a black eye. I had barked my shins and head on a very small doorway between sections of the sub. I had to both duck down and take a high step in order to get through. I can't imagine doing this in an emergency situation. But the red light, the singing, and the concussion-inducing collision with the door wore me out. So I decided it was time to risk the danger of slipping into the Varambisio. I relaxed my eyesight, gripped the soul stone a little tighter, and allowed myself to see the threads of creation. I didn't slip back far enough to see into the past, though I know I would have learned exactly what had happened here. It is possible to learn too much. The sub was a concentration of dead men, all of whom died at sea and under extreme duress. I was not going to subject myself to whatever it is that I would see in the Visio through that. While I did see the usual threads of gravity, seeing the individual threads that made up the walls and floor and ceiling, I also caught one sickly green thread weaving its way toward me and leading down the hallway. Even in the red light, I could tell it was green. There was some sort of enchantment in the song. I didn't take Einstein to figure that out. Being in the Visio allowed me not only to see the thread, but to remove its power over me, more completely than the mild concussion did before. I weaved together a filter to put over my ears, and then sort of hunch-jumped through the doorway and walked down the passage. While the song continued, it did not carry any weight or threat to me. As I walked, I noticed streaks on the floor. I bent down and touched them, still wet. I caught the coppery tang of blood. I believe the captain said he was missing three men. I suspect something had found them. I drew my Colt 1911 and held it in my right hand while my left gripped the soul stone. I walked past more cots lining the hallway. I walked past an engine room, crowded with machinery so out of date as likely no one alive knew how to use it. I walked through an ancient kitchen, or I think it was on a submarine or ship, so I guess it's called a galley. There's a coffee pot as large as a toddler. I guess that's one benefit of being in the Navy. Although I imagine submarine coffee tastes terrible. I walked past a corridor that didn't have any cots, but did have several small rooms with beds in them. I guess this must have been where the officers slept. There were still some of those bloody streaks on the floor, leading down the hallway. Finally, I followed the streaks to the control room. Lying there on the floor was the most disgusting creature I'd ever seen. It was some sort of half-woman, half-bird creature. Her face was perfectly, generically human, and curved down to a bird's neck and torso. But, of course, she sported a pair of mammalian breasts. Her arms were wings that sprouted from where her shoulder blades would have been, as opposed to attached to the neck like a normal human. One of her wings looked broken. It bent off at an odd angle. Finally, her body ended with two stumpy legs. Her stomach was bloated to the point of obscenity. I guess she ate the three men the captain sent in here disgusting. She was the source of the singing. The second I heard an enchanted song, I kind of expected a siren. I just didn't expect it to look this pathetic. A beautiful woman drawing me close? Perhaps. Some eldritch horror with spikes and multiple throats? Sure, why not? Not this doughy lump. I aimed down the sights of my gun and provided the finale to her song. The submarine was still bathed in red, I was still in the Visio. She was dead. Suddenly, behind me, I heard a deep, bellowing staccato rumble, as though a bass drum were thrumming. But it was more jovial than that. It was as if the music itself was happy. Walking through a bulkhead stepped a man, dressed in a maroon hooded robe, the fringes of which were outlined in fur. In the Visio, even in the red light from the submarine, I could see him exactly the way he was. He stood about five inches shorter than me, and leaned a little on a long walking staff. His feet were sandaled, and his robe was cinched with a golden rope. In his other hand, he carried a book under his arm. I looked into his eyes, and saw dancing merriment there, joy such as I have not seen, but lined with old sadness and pain. This man carried scars, yet he was not bothered by them. (laughs) I I thought you weren't real. I said, with a stupid grin on my face. Currently, I am more real than you are, Santa replied, with a bit more of a composed smile on his face. So, what is this, then? I asked, 
gesturing to the submarine, the siren, everything. Did you not know that I am the patron saint of those lost at sea? If I, like the rest of my brothers and sisters, am to one day judge angels, then it is my duty to learn to obey the Father in these smaller matters. He shifted his weight and started leaning heavily on the staff, resting his chin on the very top. He stared at me with a bemused expression. So, the siren, then? When this vessel was in use, the creature flew in while the vessel was riding the surface. She hypnotized and killed the crew, feeding on them. But she had broken her wing in the process. For eighty long years, she languished, starving, suffering, unable to die, as her kind is all but immortal, yet unable to escape, as the ship had descended to the ocean floor, intact but not functional. For her sake, the ocean was not allowed to breach the hull. And so, when she finally cried out to the father and begged his aid, he sent me, and I brought the ship back home. She had a chance at redemption, which, as you know, the creatures willingly lost in true and utter darkness never get. But she succumbed to her bestial nature and fed on those men who were sent to investigate. You then gave her the judgment her actions required. <laughs> I said, well, that's a long and convoluted process to just kill one siren. If you had let her die in the ocean, then the three men would still be alive. That is not for me to judge God's actions, young James, nor for you. There is a reason this vessel was brought here, a reason the siren was allowed the chance to make a choice, and a reason why those men had to die. It just may take us some time to realize it, much like it will take you time to understand what happened to your brother, John. Whoa, hold on. That is not a discussion on the table, Santa. I held out my hand and took a step forward. I wasn't ready to discuss John. Not now. Not ever. Definitely not with this ghost, or whatever he was. I mean, he didn't look like ghosts usually do in the Visio, but what else could he be? You haven't talked to your parents since the night he died, James. They miss their sons. You never even told them what happened to John. As far as they know, one son is ignoring them and the other is missing. Look, I said with a bit more emotion than I like to admit was in my voice. I'll call my parents when I fix John. Then they can see both sons. I can explain everything to them then, including what happened earlier this year. Ah, yes, that. You have not even told your superiors about that yet either, have you? Very well then, James. I shall give you your gift for the year. Your parents do not remember their time being tortured by the demon god Loki. They do not even think of it as a dream. In their minds, it never even happened. I felt as though I'd been kicked in the stomach. Of course. I've been thinking for months that when Loki kidnapped my parents, after the time Jack, Sean, and I rescued Control, that my parents had been avoiding me as much as I had been avoiding them. I thought they were haunted by the memories of what had happened to them. I didn't want to bring up those nightmares. But if they didn't remember it at all, then... Then I was the one torturing them by staying away. Um... Thanks. I managed to get out. I was not the one responsible for that mercy, James. Know this... We are watching. We are rooting for you. All of heaven is waiting with bated breath, because we're not sure what the Almighty has planned for you. And we can't wait to find out. St. Nicholas winked at me right then, and he was gone. I walked out of the submarine, explained what had happened to the captain. I guess he was going to find some way to spend the men's death so it didn't sound like an attack from the Otra Terre. Don't know what he'll do with the sub. The way he was acting, I think he'll just enjoy sinking it with his own hands. <laughs> he probably will push the button himself. Anyway, Control, Jack, Sean, any of the newbies listening, I'm going to take the rest of the year off. I need to hop a flight up to visit my parents. 
they, um, we need to have a conversation. I think I'll tell them everything. Until next time, this is Jim Donovan, over and out. And Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Pinkerton's Ghosts is a podcast distributed by Superversive Radio, a license under an attribution non-commercial, share-alike international license. This episode was written by Ken Dickerson and performed by the same. Ben Wheeler edits, directs, produces, and herds cats. Ken Dickerson performs our audio editing. Visit us on Facebook, read articles on SuperversiveSF.com, or listen to us on unauthorized Acast, iTunes, or Spotify. Contact us through Twitter at, at Pinkerton's Ghosts, email us at PinkertonsGhosts at gmail.com, or send us noble messenger possums with messages strapped to their backs. Don't worry, they know how to find us. Thank you for listening, and good luck.